was there at the time, there was an agreement among the school committee and the select board to reduce that slightly down to an 8.2%. And again, so that was in March. And then as we know, everything changed after that time period. So all departments were asked to look at their fiscal year 21 budgets again. Uh, there was a focus really on the classroom, staying with students, focus on maintaining instructional quality, and then also kind of forward looking into FY21 um, and beyond, but to look to reduce or eliminate any one-time purchases that would happen in FY21 that wouldn't be ne needed in the future in FY22. And also to review all the other funding sources, which will look at a little bit later, and then the potential of deferring capital projects, again, as just another funding source. So what came out of that were reductions that were able to be made mostly around one-time purchases, as I said, also looking to grants, moving things that um, we could potentially move into grants, and in terms of uh, tuitions, there are also changes in student needs. So going through these briefly, in student services, they were able to reduce their expense side by this amount. And again, these were one-time purchases and that we were able to move this into FY20 and purchase these items. So these are items, again, that are still needed but with the savings that we'll talk about later that happened in FY20, because of shutdown, we were able to shift this spending into FY20 because these, again, are still things that were needed moving forward. Regular education, the strategy was the same. Um, take care of those one-time purchases in FY20 and shift as much as possible into grants. Athletics was asked to level fund looking really at their supplies and special education tuitions this was really a break in our favor as as we know student need changes uh all the time and this one did change in our favor so that was a nice um break for us in terms of the expenses again looking at positions the focus was really to stay within the classroom and so you can see the FTEs that were reduced from the ask. And as Dr. Kavanaugh said, these are discussions that happen with the administrations. Um, they put forward these changes and they are comfortable with this structure moving forward into FY21, think, feeling that really the focus is still within the classroom. It's very much the focus on the student and we will be able to move forward with our students and be able to make these reductions. So looking at the FTE reductions, classroom teaching, one FTE uh, was reduced, which was actually really only a 0.4 reduction at the high school level and 0.6 was moved to a grant. So while it looks as though it's a, a 1.0 reduction, it really is only a cut of, a, of 0.4 because 0.6 of that was moved to a grant. And the other 1.0 in, in teaching is transferring of a general education reading specialist into a special education role. And this is really supported by the caseloads. Social emotional uh, with the, you know, being able to hire the classroom teachers uh, the administration is comfortable with uh, reducing this request for the adjustment counselors. They feel that that's something that they can move forward with, keeping those class sizes where they are with the additional teaching requests. And the support departments, uh, again, just really keeping the focus within the classroom. Um, these positions were, were reduced or cut. Um, and then in addition, two um, general education paraprofessionals were, that were hired this year uh, due to increased class sizes. Because we are able to hire those additional teaching positions at Hopkins, 
um, the administration is comfortable with reducing two FTEs. So that's where the support uh, reductions come from. Building and grounds, it's a reduction of the three FTEs that were requested for custodial and technology, a request of reduction of uh, the webmaster, and that would continue to be covered by a stipended position. So looking at the reductions in terms of money, we were able to bring that $1.8 million staff request down to 1.2 million. And again, looking forward to the other funding sources, um, because of what we were able to do with FY20 in covering revenue loss in the different revolving, and we'll get into that later in the, in the um, budget update for FY20, um, but we were able to be sure that these revolving accounts will carry us forward not only in FY21, but also in FY22. So in doing so, we were able to squeeze a little bit more money out of both the bus fee revolving and the circuit breaker um, revolving. So we're able to increase that offset, which basically means it's an additional decrease to the increase in expenses. The other part of the strategy is looking at the capital plan. Um, and deferring that until the May town meeting. So again, looking at all the funding sources, uh, this allows free cash to be used for the operating budget, which from a strategy standpoint, it is one-time funding, but it does get us through one more year. And so pushing off these capital items and not using free cash for, the, for these gives us another revenue source um, to fund the FY21 operating budget. So where does that leave us? Again, contractual obligations stay intact. We've been able to reduce the staff requests down to 1.2 million and the expense increase down to 131. And again, the, that asterisk is um, the reduction includes being able to pull on those other funding sources bringing the budget down to 6.6. .6. And as a reminder, just um, in, in terms of all the different funding uh, sources from the, in working with the town, this does include the use of $900,000 from the HCA stabilization. And again, free cash not used for capital projects. So while we don't really get involved in the actual funding that's really on the town side, that's just um, another piece to the puzzle, if you will, for everyone to keep in mind. And then if we take it a step further, uh, and the reason that we're looking to the, the FY21 budget now, because we are looking to have an agreement and for the school committee to accept and pass the budget, really allows us to hire those positions in that 1.2 million additional staff asks um, because we, we would need those positions in place. And you'll see that as part of these, the 112th budget. So this is using our FY21 budget as opposed to the FY20. Um, and so what we're doing is looking at what the spending pattern was in FY20, but really using the FY21 numbers. And the thing that most people don't understand is school year spending is not straight line. So in the summer, we're buying all the supplies that so that they're here uh, by the time the students walk in the door. So there is a lot of spending in terms of supplies in July and August. And then in September becomes that first payroll for staff. So you, you can see that the, the spending wa varies widely, um, but that's why it passing the um, FY21 budget becomes important because we need to get those positions hired and in place so they're ready for that September. They're ready for those kids when they, when they walk in. So it is all somewhat intertwined, 
um, but just to give you a peek at not only what the 21 budget does, but what that does for our monthly budgets that, that need to be accepted by the DOR um, for us to move forward and continue um, doing business. So that is the end of that. Um, and we can open it up to questions. Great, thank you. I just wanna make sure we can see. Uh, is there anybody on the committee who would like to add anything before we open it up to the public for uh, questions and comments? I know we've seen this in a prior meeting, so it's not brand new to us. Okay, so at, at this time, if there are people who would like to speak, uh, if they could indicate by raising your hand, uh, it, we can make sure that your microphone is, is on so we can all hear you and, and you can go ahead and address anybody here in attendance. Okay, I do not see, I think I can see everybody in the meeting, but uh, does anybody see any questions or comments or people seeking to make a comment or a question if I'm missing anybody? I, I, I do see one from that. Uh, I do see a hand raised. Great. So since I can't see it, I'm going to ask if, if, can, uh, um, if Georgette either, I don't know if Georgette is muted or if people have muted from okay. home. The she's actually, she's unmuted. actually unmuted. She's unmuted. Oh, great. Go ahead. Hi. Do I have to say my name and where I live or how does or it work? Just your name is fine. Okay. Um, I'm Leah Butler Rafferty. Um, I've been listening to these budget talks. And first of all, I'm amazed by how quickly this has come together and how much work um, the, the superintendent and her staff have done to get this put together. My concern is... I'm wondering if there's pivot points in that budget for things like, oh, there might be a second wave. And so September might look really different. And do you, do you have that planned into the budget as it stands? So do you know what to, what to do if in two months, you know, they're like, oh, you have to homeschool again? Um, I, I'm just curious. I know it's a lot to ask, so, but I, I I just, um, it seems like it could be a possibility, right? People have been talking about second waves. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. And then Susan, anything that you would like to add, please do. Uh, we have been following very closely, Commissioner Jeffrey Riley has been meeting regularly with superintendents around the state. And on most things that have been related to COVID-19, uh, he has left a lot of the autonomy up to each individual, individual school district. On June 15th, he has told all of the school districts that he will be giving us a directive about how to reopen our doors in the fall. Um, I do believe that the directive will be that we are going to be opening our doors, but on a part-time basis. The way he has described it is to say that there's a continuum really, where on one side you are using remote learning and on another you are open full-time he feels like we will fall somewhere in the middle. And what he has also said is that in the event that a district wants to move either you know, left or right on that continuum, what we should be able to do is put together some kind of a compelling argument to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to ensure that uh, what we would like to do in Hopkinton would be approved by the department. Uh, we have, you know, I think, thought very hard about what our school buildings are going to have to look like. And that doesn't mean that we are ready to open our doors. But for example, today we conducted audits of all five buildings. Where would we need plexiglass? We have actually purchased face shields for every child in case we need to get to that place. And we're trying to be out in front of this so that we get the best pricing and the best availability of all of this PPE that we're going to need for kids. Um, in the event that we are not able to do things like have, you know, an orchestra class or have a PE wellness class just because there are so many kids with so much breathing in one space, you know, the, the hope would be to 
you know, find a setting in which those things could happen or redeploy the faculty, you know, that, that typically teach those courses. But it is our intention to keep all of our, our folks employed. We do have questions about um, custodial staff, you know, what will cleaning look like? And as you saw in Mrs. Rothermick's presentation, we did remove three custodians. So the question then becomes, if we're not having any of those sort of extracurricular activities, such as, you know, basketball or kids being allowed to linger in the school or clubs, then maybe the cleaning duties become far less strained on our custodial staff. Or maybe what we realize is that, you know, we're just not getting it done that way. Another area where we have concerns is with nursing. You know, so if we are doing some kind of temperature check, and at this point, the CDC calls that um, one of the things that is sort of, if possible, that's what we keep reading, if feasible. So if we have some kind of, you know, electronic mechanism by which we can tell if a student needs to stay home because he's unwell, or if we have someone in the middle of the day um, become ill, that's an awful lot of record keeping and an awful lot of work for our nurses. So, you know, we are, are planning to, to open our doors in the way that we are directed to do so. And yeah, we may need to make those kinds of shifts. And I'm hoping that we can go to um, our town manager, our select board, our town CFO, and you know, kind of explain where we are. And maybe some of the COVID restricted monies that have come into the town will help us get over those hurdles. So I mean, that, that's kind of a big plan now. I, you know, when you have a, a great big pot of money that's come into the community for those purposes, you can feel a whole lot safer going into the school year. Thank you. I would just add, um, you know, what to what Dr. Cavanaugh was saying is, is the CARES funding will allow us to be able to either pay for contracted services or hire people with, you know, that clarity um, is still not completely there. Uh, we'll continue to make sure that we walk in line with what the requirements are for the CARES Act, but we will ensure that the buildings are clean to the level that we need them to be cleaned, whether again, it's contracted service or the CARES Act is, allows us to hire. But you know that funding is available for us and also any other additional monitoring, whether it be medical or anything that we need to do to be in compliance is one of the avenues um, that is a, a, one of the funding places that we can pull on the, on the CARES Act. So yeah, I mean, we are looking to be able to pivot. We won't have to pull on this budget uh, to be able to um, bring in the PPE, make sure that there's additional cleaning. You know, the, the budget will be for education as normal and those additional requirements and monitoring and everything else, we should be able to pull from the federal funding sources. Thank you very, very much. Are there others? I can see if you click on the raise hand if you want to be acknowledged that way and you can unmute yourself even if you don't want to be on camera. If you have any questions or comments. Anybody? Anything from either Mr. Kamala or Mr. O'Leary that you want to add? Uh, that has not already, we have not already brought out. Good evening. I have nothing ever further to add. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here. I know this isn't. Likewise, I think Ms. Rothmick uh, covered it perfectly. The 80% of the funding for next year is in salaries as always, and we have the money to pay people. And everything else we can figure out as things unfold and more information becomes available. And we're, we continue to work very closely with the school uh, administration toward that end. All right, I just wanna to look to make sure I'm not missing anybody that wants to, Amanda, did you wanna make a comment? I did you have a question on uh, process for tonight. Do you want school committee to enter into this discussion on budget now, or do you want us to hold for what it's an agenda item for us? I think we should hold until it's an agenda item. Agreed, okay.
Okay, so I just, I'm gonna ask everybody that's kind of looking around at the screen to make sure I'm not missing anybody uh, because I don't wanna exit out of this forum before um, anybody that wishes to speak has had that opportunity. Okay then, thank you. And thank you all who've come uh, to participate in this and hear about our budget. Obviously these are uh, unusual times that we would be going back and taking another crack at the budget this time around, but uh, I wanna applaud all of our town partners and all of our people that have worked at every level of the administration to really try to pare this down to something more tenable for the town. Um, and at this time, if and I'm just gonna double check to make sure there aren't any other comments, then at this time, I'm gonna seek a motion to enter into an executive session to comply with or act under the authority of MGLC 30A S21A2, specific to review of executive session minutes for January 20, 2020, April 30, 2020, and May 14, 2020. And I am just taking that out of order so that we can start our the re rest of our meeting at uh, our scheduled seven o'clock time uh, so that if there are public comments, then we'll be able to get to them. So moved. Okay, so thank you. A motion by Meg and a second. Second. Second by Amanda. So I'll do a roll call starting with you, Amanda. Aye. And then Jen. Yes. And then Meg. Aye. So we will exit into executive session at 6.30 and we will return uh, to the public session for the purposes of our regular meeting. And so I, Thank you all and we will be back then and then um, we can go th through the link to join the executive session. So thank I'm gonna you. thank you. Thanks everybody. Yes, thanks everyone.